I would now like to introduce Shelly Yu. Shelly is a Parkinson's physiotherapist and staff member at Parkinson's Society BC. She is trained in PD Warrior, Dance for PD, and Parkinson's Pilates. She is also the Advocacy Officer at the Canadian Physiotherapy Association's Global Health Division, which fights for healthcare equity in rural and suburban areas. I'd like to pass it over to Shelley now. Hi, Shelley, welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? I can hear you. I think I'm getting some feedback from your microphone there, Alana. I can hear myself as well. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, hopefully you can all hear me, you can all see me, giving you a wave here. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our talk on balance and falls. So you'll probably see here that the slides look a little bit funny. Um, and you can see almost like a page and a half of the slides. And the reason for that is just because we've had to upload the slides in a PDF format um, because the PowerPoint wasn't working for some reason. So I do apologize um, if it looks a little bit funny, um, but we'll still go through the slides and um, you can just focus on the, the first slide and ignore the half of the second one. So um, as we go along today with our talk, we um, if, please feel free to type in any questions that you have in the chat box and I'll do my best to answer them as we go along. Um, I know it's hard to make the talk as interactive as possible on a webinar platform, but um, we'll still try our best. So do feel free to ask questions as we go along. And in case I miss anything, we will have some time for questions at the end as well. So um, as you're already aware, the talk is titled Balance and Falls, Joining the Puzzle Pieces. And um, the reason that we've chosen a Balance and Falls as a, um, as a talk to do today is because I think that a lot of the times in Parkinson's, um, falls is a huge topic and everybody always talks about how um, their balance is off or their balance is poor. And sometimes when you ask health professionals what you can do about your balance, you might get quite a mixed bag of answers and, and nothing's quite a straightforward and nothing's really black and white. So the purpose of today's talk is I'm going to try my best to translate the research behind balance and falls and try to make it as practical as possible so that um, you can go away with an idea of the types of things that you might be able to do to help improve your balance and to reduce your falls as much as you can in the future. Okay, um, so I do see a couple of comments here that you can't hear me, so hopefully, um, hopefully you can turn up your volume and then you can hear me a little bit better. I, sorry, that's probably not a very, um, uh, a very helpful way to, to troubleshoot because on my end, my mic is on and I know that most of you can hear me. Okay, so when we talk about balance, why is it such a big deal in Parkinson's and, and why do we care so much about balance and why do we always talk about falls? Well, if you look at the statistics of the number of people falling, you can see that 60% of people with Parkinson's will fall at some point during the year and 39% of these will be recurrent falls, so falls um, a, a multiple times. And if you look at this percentage and you compare it to other populations that tend to fall, so for example, the elderly population um, or other populations like people with multiple sclerosis, this is actually quite a big number. It's, it's a lot higher than in other populations that are prone to fall. So we can see that it's already a pretty big problem. There's lots of people falling. And of course, we know that falls can also cause lots of different problems like it can um, put people in hospital from injuries like maybe if you broke a hip um, it can reduce your future mobility because you might be fearful of falling from your first fall already so you're um, not mobilizing as much um, or because you're scared of falling you're tensing your muscles um, as you're standing up and walking and that causes you to fall even more because you're not able to activate the muscles properly it might reduce your quality of life because you feel you're not able to participate in social events because you're scared about your mobility 
It might give, give your caregiver some stress about fearing that you'll fall, and it might even reduce your life expectancy because we know that with um, immobility, so the less mobile you are, the more prone you are to having certain infections or illnesses um, like chest infections or um, having a urinary tract infections and things like that. So given that we know the cases of people with Parkinson's will continue to increase, you can already imagine that falls is going to be or is already a huge issue. And so it's really important for us to tackle this problem and figure out exactly why people are falling and what we can do about it. And so when we talk about falls and we, if we look at the research about why we fall, you can see that there's a lot of different reasons why we fall and it's not all just down to balance. So you're not just falling because your balance is poor. It might be one of the contributing factors, but actually fall um, balance is a very small part of what might cause you to fall. So you can see here in the slide that there's all these list of reasons of things that could cause you to fall. And you can see in the second thing here, um, you can see the second point here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. You can see the second point here. Um, it says postural instability or in other words, balance. So when we talk about posture instability, that's what we mean. That's the balance that we're talking about. So you can see that um, balance is just a very small part of, of what makes you fall. And there are lots of other reasons that you can fall. So for example, if you're someone with history of falls, it shows in statistics that you're more likely to fall again. And one of the reasons for that is probably because if you've already fallen, you're either someone with um, poor mobility already, maybe you have poor leg strength already, maybe you have poor balance already, or perhaps from your previous fall, you've injured yourself and now you're less mobile than before, or you might have a fear of falling because you have fallen before, and therefore you tense your muscles in different ways as you're walking and you're moving, and that then causes you to fall again. And then of course, we know freezing of gait also makes you fall. So if you're someone who gets freezing of gait, meaning that your feet feel they're stuck on the floor and they're kind of on the spot like this and you just can't quite move forward, but then your upper body is still propelling forward because you're still trying to walk and therefore your feet are stuck, but your trunk is still going forward and then you end up falling forward. Um, if you're someone with leg muscle weakness, you're also more likely to fall. So if your legs can't sustain the weight of your body and it can't help you take steps, then yes, you're more likely to fall. If you're someone with poor mobility, you're also more likely to fall. So poor mobility, meaning that you're less agile, you're less able to mo mobilize for various reasons, whether it's leg strength weakness, um, or it might be freezing of gait or something else. But the chances are, if you have poor mobility, you probably have less opportunity to practice your mobility because you're scared of falling. So you're not getting up as often. And therefore, you kind of spiral into that um, never ending cycle where because you're not moving, your leg muscles are getting weaker. But because they're getting weaker, you're also not moving. Um, and then you can also see here that if you're someone with cognitive impairment, you're also more likely to fall. So if you have um, uh, cognitive changes where you're more impulsive or you're um, having some hallucinations where you think that you can hear someone at the door, so you're standing up and rushing to the door and then you end up tripping. So things like that could also cause you to fall. Um, fear of falling, we already talked about, is another reason that you might fall. So if you're already fearful of falling because you have fallen before, or maybe you haven't fallen before, but you're scared of falling, you end up tensing your muscles in different ways as you stand up. You're tensing them more, you're more braced in your posture and your movement, and therefore you're actually more likely to fall because of that. And of course, we know that things like disease severity, so the more severe your Parkinson's is, the more likely you will to fall because of things like you're more likely to freeze, you're more likely to have dyskinesia. And also if you had the disease for longer, the chances are your disease severity is, is, is more severe than other people. So then you're also more likely to fall. And then um, not so surprisingly, if you're somebody who is on a high dosage of levodopa, if you've had DBS, if you are on more than three medications, you're also more likely to fall. Now, it's really important to note here that it's not because that the high dosage of levodopa or the DBS or the polypharmacy that makes you fall, 
but it's actually more likely that because you are on a higher dose of levodopa, you've had DBS, you're on lots of different medications, you're probably already somebody with a more severe disease progression and therefore you're falling because of that rather than the increased levodopa making you fall. But these are kind of statistic um, correlations that we found. And then depression is also something that can make you fall because if you're depressed, you're um, less motivated to do things, you might be more socially isolated. And if you're less likely to move around, you're less likely to exercise, you're less likely to do things, then of course you are more likely to be deconditioned and then that might make you fall as well. So axial rigidity means um, uh, stiffness in your, in your trunk, in your upper body. And the more stiff you are in your upper body, the less, um, the, the, the more chance of you falling because of how stiff you are, the less mobile your arms are, the less mobile your uh, trunk posture is. So if you're always in a forward leaning posture, that also makes you fall because you can imagine your center of gravity is a lot further forward and it's a lot more difficult to catch yourself if you were to lose your balance. And of course, the last thing on this list, urinary incontinence, meaning that if you um, have issues holding in your bladder, you're also more likely to fall. And the reason for that is because if you're always uh, rushing to go to the bathroom, you're probably less careful on your way to the bathroom. You might trip, um, you might fall, or if you um, um, have an accident in, in your underpants, then you might be more prone to things like urinary tract infection, which then makes you more confused and that can make you fall as well. So you can see on this list here that there are lots of reasons why you might fall. So all of these things could be causes that makes you fall and balance is just a small part of this. So balance is the second point on this list, which is um, posture instability. So you can see balance is a very small part of what can actually make you fall. Um, even though the popular belief is that, oh, well, the reason you're falling is because your balance is poor, but it might not actually be that's the problem. It might be any of these other things on the list that's making you fall in addition to your balance, or maybe um, not because balance is making you fall, but maybe something else like freezing of gait is making you fall. Um, there's a question here on the chat box that says, what is the number mean of each point and is, and is it a per percent of people affected? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So I didn't put any stats on here for exactly how many people fall. So these, so the list here um, of the reasons that you fall tend to be the ones that are the most common. So of course, everyone's gonna fall for different reasons and it's very difficult to get um, an exhaustive list of exactly why you fall, but these tend to be the most common ones and the most agreed upon. And you can see um, under each point, I put little brackets with little numbers. So these are the references that the papers are from, which you'll see at the end. So when we talk about all these things, about um, um, things that cause people to fall, you can imagine here that we that a lot of these things on the list we can't actually change like for example how long you've had your Parkinson's or how severe your Parkinson's is or maybe cognitive impairment so some of these things we can't change and until you can 100% eliminate all of these things on the list you can't 100% prevent falls but what we can do is we can take these risk factors here and try to modify them and change them or find strategies as much as we can in order to reduce as much falls as we can. And you can see here on this slide that I've highlighted some of the things in red. So the things that are in red are things that you can change and the things that are in black are things that you can't necessarily change. And so, um, so we already talked about things that we can't change. So for example, your history of falls. If you're someone who's already fallen and we know that having a history of fall can um, cause you to fall again in the future because you're either someone who is um, already uh, a little bit poor in your mobility or maybe you have fear of falling that contributes to your fall. So we can't change the past. We can't change the history of falls. Cognitive impairment, we can't really change that either because if you've already, uh, you're someone with memory issues, hallucination issues, um, yes, you might be able to tweak some of your medication to help with that, but generally you can't really change your cognitive impairment. You can't change your disease severity. You can't change how long you've had the disease. So the things that are in black are things that you can't change, but the things that are in red are things that we can possibly think about changing or modifying to give you the best chance of reducing falls in the future. 
So you might be thinking, okay, well, we can change these things in red, but what, what can we actually do to change them? Well, you can see here in my next slide, um, some of the things are written in blue. So posture instability, um, aka balance, is something we're going to talk about a little bit um, later on. So don't worry about that right now. We'll go a little bit deeper into the balance component of things. But if we think about freezing of gait, there are things that you can do to help you reduce your freezing of gait as much as possible. So for example, freezing of gait, you can think about strategies that might help you overcome the feet um, sticking to the floor. So you might be someone who is using auditory cues. So auditory cues meaning that maybe you're using a metronome. So a metronome and you're trying to step to the beat of the metronome. Um, maybe you're listening to music every time you walk and then you're trying to step to the beat of the music. That might help you. Um, or you might be telling yourself left, right, left, right as you're walking or one, two, one, two as you're walking to try to step to that beat. Or you might be somebody who's using visual cues. So maybe you've got lines on your floor like from your carpet or hardwood floor and you're trying to step on each line. Sometimes that can help with the visual cues. Or maybe you're someone with a laser beam on your walker and you're trying to get your foot to um, go towards, step towards the, the laser beam every time. That can also help with visual cueing. Or you might be someone who's using imagery. So if your feet are they're really stuck, maybe you're imagining, okay, I'm a palm tree swaying in the wind and you're swaying your weight, you're shifting your weight from side to side. And then that gets bigger over time. And then you're eventually able to move your feet in the swaying position to keep going forward. Or you might be somebody who's thinking about um, distracting your brain. So rather than thinking about, okay, I'm going to step forward, maybe you're doing something else. Like maybe you're sidestepping, maybe you're dancing to move forward, or maybe you're uh, walking on a diagonal. So things like that, that um, distracts your brain from the actual task of walking forward can also be helpful. So these are some examples of ways that you might be able to overcome your freezing in order to um, reduce your falls. And then leg muscle weakness, of course, we know with leg muscle weakness, you can do things like strengthening exercises for your legs. You can practice walking in order to strengthen the muscles, which then can help you walk better and reduce your falls. If you're someone with poor mobility, you might want to be thinking about different equipment or aids that you can use to help yourself um, walk better. So maybe you're using a mobility aid like a walker or um, poles or sticks or something like that. Or you might have grab bars at home that you can hold on to. Maybe you have a shower chair in your shower. Or maybe you're adding lights along in your hallway so that if you are getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you can use the light to help guide your weight and you're less likely to fall. Um, or you might be thinking about removing some rugs that might be loose on the floor so you don't trip on them and fall. And then fear of falling. Um, if you're someone with fear of falling, things that you might be able to do to help improve that would be, well, number one, to keep practicing your walking in a safe environment so that you can improve your confidence over time. Or you might be somebody who is seeking cognitive behavior therapy to help you overcome some of the fears that you might have around um, about mobility and falls. If you're someone with depression, of course, you can um, see your doctor and get some medication for that. You might be um, undergoing some counseling to help you find strategies around that. Um, or you might be someone who is exercising because exercise releases endorphins, which then make us happier and it would help with your depression. Or you might be someone who is seeking some um, social interaction um, so you feel more connected to your community. You feel like you, you have a social support system, which then helps with your depression as well. And of course, axial rigidity is what we talked about a little bit earlier with your trunk stiffness and um, uh, the rigidity that you have in your upper body. So things that you can do to help with that would be mobility exercises, not as in walking, but mobility as in joint mobility. So stretching exercises, um, twisting exercises, big amplitude type exercises to help you overcome those. So. You can see from this list um, that so these are so the list here is there are all the reasons that could make you fall. So all the different things, risk factors that cause you to fall. Um, and you can see that balance, posture instability, which is the second point here, is a very small part of what can cause you to fall. So it's not just balance that's making you fall, but it's any of these things on the list that can also contribute to you falling. So 
Because the talk here is focused on balance specifically in false, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the postural instability aspect of this list and talk a little bit about the complexity that is balance and, and what components of balance that might be contributing to your falls and some practical ways of what we can do about it. So hopefully so far um, everybody's with me and hopefully this all kind of makes sense so far. Um, if not, please feel free to ask questions and I'll try my best to answer them. So we said we would dive a little bit deeper into postural instability or balance, which is circled here in the slide that you can see. So all of these things on the list can make you fall. Balance is a very small part of what can cause you to fall. So it's not just having poor balance that's going to make you fall, but there's lots of other things. So you can see that in order to get to the bottom of what is making you fall and how we can reduce your falls, it's very important to um, have somebody who is trained in balance and falls, like a Parkinson's physiotherapist, to help go over some of these things and see what is causing you to fall and find strategies around it. Um, so, John, you're saying that you see half of the bottom of the slide. Yes. So um, the slides here, they're in PDF format because, unfortunately, the PowerPoint um, was cutting off at the corners. So we had to upload the PDF format. So do ignore the bottom part of the slide. Just look at the top slide. Um, the bottom part is half of the, sec um, the, the, the following slide. So I do apologize that it probably looks a little bit confusing. Um, but just ignore the bottom bit and just look at the top bit. So... If we concentrate on posture instability, so where we have it circled, if we dive into posture instability or aka balance, you can see here that there are six different components with balance. So balance itself is a very complicated topic and it's not just a reflex. Balance is not a reflex at all. It's not your body's response um, to perturbations per se, but it's six different things that make up your balance. So the first one here you can see is biomechanical constraints. So biomechanical um, constraints and balance would be things like your um, joint and muscle. So your, um, your ankle, knee, hip, trunk, shoulder, elbow, wrist, finger, joint uh, mobility. So how much movement you've got in each of these joints, how much strength you've got in each of these joints, what your muscle length is like, um, what your uh, trunk posture is like, like are you hunched forward in a forward stoop posture, are you able to extend back, so all of these things that are um, biomechanical, so in our joints and our muscle, these are the things that we're looking at that can contribute to uh, whether you have good or poor balance, and of course we know that in Parkinson's you tend to have a reduced range of movement, you tend to have more stiffness in the muscles, um, the strength might be less as a result, and you tend to be in a more forward-leaning posture. So all of these things can, can cause you to have poor balance. And then if we look at the second thing here, which is our stability limits and verticality, this basically means our ability to bring our center of gravity over a base of support without losing balance. So in, in other words, um, how far we can bring our body over our feet without having to change our stance, without having to move our feet to catch our balance. So how far can we sway over our feet without losing our balance? and our ability to maintain an anti-gravity upright position. So if you're someone who's sitting, are your muscles able to hold you up vertically against gravity, or are you sort of stooping to one side? And so this can, of course, contribute to whether you have good or bad balance, um, because the, the less stability limit you have, so the less ability you have to sway over your base of support, um, the, the more likely you are to fall. And we know that in Parkinson's, you tend to have a reduced ability to sway over your base of support. Um, that, that kind of stability is a lot smaller in someone without Parkinson's. And you might also have issues maintaining that upright um, position um, against gravity. And then, of course, other things that can also make you fall would be something we call anticipatory posture adjustments, which basically means your body's ability to prepare you for voluntary movement. So before you actually move or do any kind of movement, your body is actually preparing you in the background without you even realizing it's preparing your body for this movement. It's your body's ability to adjust your posture, um, adjust the muscle contractions in response to a planned voluntary movement. So 
For example, if you're trying to um, take a step forward with your right foot, for example, your body is holding your trunk in a nice um, uh, strong posture so that your trunk is not going to be flopping all over the place as you're taking the step forward. You might be preparing yourself to adjust your weight to the left foot so then you can free up your right foot to then step forward. So this planning of, of voluntary movement is something that um, we see to be slower or um, might not always be there in some of Parkinson's. And then we have our reactive postural response. So our reactive postural response um, is our body's ability to adjust our postural um, um, stance when we're moving in order to stop us from falling over. So for example, if you're already moving, let's say you all of a sudden you're walking down the street and then you all of a sudden step in a loose paven slab that rocks and it shakes your foot underneath and it's your body's ability to catch your balance and catch yourself and not let yourself fall in response to a unexpected um, um, perturbation, excuse me, to your balance. So your body's ability to adjust and react to these things can determine whether you have good balance or not. And we know that in Parkinson's, we happen to see a slower response in this kind of reactive posture adjustment or might not be there at all. Sensory orientation is our body's ability to rely on different senses in order to keep us balanced. So we use three different senses to keep us balanced. So vision, we use eyes, eyesight, so you can see where you're going and that keeps us balanced. We use the fluid in our inner ear, so there's fluid that moves around in your inner ear as you move your head. And this fluid, the speed at which the fluid moves and the direction at which the fluid moves tells us what direction we're moving and how quickly we're moving. And then there's also the feeling in your joints and your and your feet that um, tell you what terrain you're walking on. You can feel how how um, stable your base of support is. And these three systems help keep us balanced. And sensory orientation is basically our body's ability to adjust and put different emphasis on each of these three systems. So, so switching back and forth between focus of each of this, these systems, depending on the situation that we're in. So for example, you might be walking down the street. Um, it's a pretty flat road, so you're relying on your vision. You can see where you're going. You know that you're balanced. You can see everything that you're stepping on. But then all of a sudden, you step in that loose pavement slab we talked about and it goes a little bit wobbly and then your vision goes a little bit funny because your head's looking all over the place so then your body is adjusting to using other things like perhaps your the fluid in your ears to help you um to, to help you know where you are and help you keep balance and help you walk so it's our body's ability to adjust to our um to the different situations that we're in and be able to put different weights on um what system you rely on more and in Parkinson's, this ability to reweight the sensory system, the ability to put emphasis on different sensory systems, depending on your situation, tends to be reduced. And you can imagine that can cause you to fall because if you can't adjust from the three different systems, then it's very hard for you to be in different uh, unstable situations. Um, so another example of that, in case that wasn't clear, would be if you're walking in your house, you're using your vision to um, help you know where you're going and help you stay balanced to navigate obstacles. But then all of a sudden the lights go out and you can't use your vision anymore. So then you might be using the feeling of your feet. You're stepping on the ground and you're feeling what you're stepping on to help you stay balanced. So that is another example. And the last component of uh, balance is stability in gait, which basically means your ability to keep you balanced and upright when you're walking. So if we think about walking, walking is, is essentially a series of controlled falls. Because, well, no, it's not falls, because your falls would be if you're uh, involuntary, involuntarily falling. But walking is a series of controlled falls because you're essentially falling from one foot to the other to step forward. So for argument's sake, you can imagine that that control of propelling yourself forward and um, being able to shift your center of gravity from one foot to the other and catch your center of gravity as you're walking is a pretty complicated process. So depending on how your um, your gait stability is, what it, it can change whether you have good balance or poor balance if you can't control um, your walking. So from these six things here, you can see that these six components make up your balance. So if you have, so if you're somebody with poor balance, 
is not just if you practice standing on one leg all the time to practice your balance, that's not necessarily going to make your balance better because you have to find out what six of these components is contributing to your bad falls um, or your, your bad balance and then rehabbing or exercising on each, working on each of these components in order to make your balance better. And then if you make your balance better, it might then make you um, reduce your falls in the future, but it might not because keep in mind our previous slides, balance is a very small part of what makes you fall. So there's all these things that can make you fall. Balance is a small part of it, but if you zoom in on the balance, there's all these other things that make up your balance. So it's a very complicated process. Um, so I can see here a comment here from Maria that says, I tend to fall backwards. It seems that somebody or something is pulling me down and across the room and it happens so fast. This is common in Parkinson's. How do I prevent this from happening? So um, falling backwards is what we call retropulsion and it's quite common in Parkinson's where you might just be standing there and then all of a sudden your, your balance just goes backwards. And this kind of comes to um, what we were saying earlier about your stability limits, your uh, so your ability to bring your weight over your center of gravity without losing balance. But it also comes to um, our posture responses, our reaction to these kind of perturbations, you catching yourself in your balance. So we'll talk about this in a little bit, Maria, when we get to the further slides, when we talk about these specific things in balance and what we can do to help that. Um, okay. So we talked about these six things that can contribute to your balance. So what can we actually do about these six things? What are some of the things that we can do practically to help you rehab each of these components? So keep in mind that just because you have poor balance doesn't mean you have all six of these systems being an issue. You might have only one of these things being an issue that contributes to your poor balance, or you might have three things on this list that, that contribute to your poor balance. But keep in mind that what affects your balance is going to be different to what affects the next person's balance. So you might have two people in the room who have four things on this list that are affecting their balance, but they're going to be four different things that affect your balance, right? So it's not going to be all of these are going to be the same for everybody. So it's important for us, so it's important for you to find someone who can assess your balance and find out what part of these six components is your main issue for balance. And then what can you actually do about it? What are some of the things that you can do to help you improve these six things? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about now. So we're going to dive in a little bit deeper. So we're going to talk about the first thing here on the list, which is biomechanical constraints. And we're going to zoom in on this and figure out what we can do to um, actually improve this. So this slide here, so again, ignore the bottom half of the slide where it says number two. We're only at looking at number one right now. So you can see here at the top corner of the slide, there is that picture of the balance, the blue balance uh, circles, the six of them. So those are the six components of balance we just talked about. And you can see the circle in red. We're going to talk about the first component first, the, the biomechanical constraints. So you'll probably remember biomechanical constraints is um, our joint mobility, our muscle length, our muscle strength. And um, so things that are mechanical in our body. So um, um, all of these things like your ankle, your knee, your hip, your trunk, your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist, your hand, all of these mobility. So how much mobility you have in each of these joints, how strong the muscles are in each of these areas, and what the length of the muscle muscles are in each of these areas. So if biomechanical constraints is your issue, if this is your problem, then things that you might be able to do would be things like lots of stretching and joint mobility exercises. So for example, if your trunk is always forward, then maybe you're doing lots of opening of the chest, lots of leaning back, chest expansion, trunk expansion type exercises to help with that. You might be doing lots of stretching, lots of rotational stretching of the different areas of the body. You might be strengthening the muscles in your body that are weak. So if you have um, weak um, legs, you might be strengthening your legs by doing things like sit to stands, some lying down exercises, maybe some squats. You might be also doing some trunk strengthening exercises if your trunk muscles are weak and you're having issues moving your trunk and your trunk is a very heavy part of your body. You can imagine if that's quite rigid and not mobile, it'd be very difficult for you to move around and balance. So you might be doing some doing um, some trunk strengthening or trunk stretching exercises. 
Um, or you might be stretching the front of your hips, maybe, if you're someone who um, is quite rigid in your hips. So there are lots of different things that you would be able to do to help with your biomechanical system, which is the first component of what makes you have good or bad balance. Um, okay, another comment here, Angela. Um, okay, so you're so Angela is saying the same thing as what Maria was saying about the falling backwards. Yep, your 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 feet tend to do quick shuffles and then you kind of go backwards. The freezing of gait again. Um, Hans is saying I walk daily using poles. We have a house with thirteen steps with which I have no problems, but wife wants a chairlift. I so stumble a lot, but thoughts there. Yeah, I mean stairs are a good exercise for you if you um, are having issues with the stairs and you want to build on your strength. But it really depends again what um, might be your issue with stairs. Like, are you falling on the stairs? That would be something different. And it and, and it depends on what you're trying to target. But yes, absolutely. If you want to do the stairs to help improve your um, your your leg strength, absolutely. I don't see why not. But um, if you aren't able to do the full set of stairs or you're having issues with falls, perhaps, yes, a chairlift would be a good idea to help address some of these things and to prevent you from falling. Um, yeah, it's, it's very individual. Um, okay, so the next part of our um, uh, the balance checklist, so you can see at the top corner um, of our biomechanical system slide that there are six blue circles that make up our balance which is what we talked about and we just talked about the first component which is biomechanical system we're going to move on to the second bit now which is limits of stability or verticality so remember limits of stability is your body's ability to bring your um, weight over your legs without you losing balance without you having to take a step forward to catch your balance for example and if this is your issue, some of the things that you might be able to do is literally swaying exercises. So the first picture you can see here down by the left side corner. Um, so you're practicing standing, not keeping your feet in one spot, and you're practicing swaying forward and backwards. You're practicing swaying sideways. You're practicing sway in circles. So you're practicing that limit of stability. So how much movement you can have over your feet without having to change the basic support, without having to take a step out or sideways or grab something for balance. And you can do the same thing with keeping your feet on one spot. Maybe you're doing some twisting movements um, and seeing whether you can keep your feet in one spot without losing your balance. Maybe you're keeping your feet on one spot and you're reaching forward, reaching to the side, reaching backwards as far as you can without losing your balance. So. These are exercises that you can do in order to help improve your limits of stability. But of course, keep in mind, everybody is different. Um, what works for you might not work for somebody else. So it's really important for um, you to have a actual assessment from a physiotherapist if you wanted to find out some more individualized things that you can do. The third component of our balance puzzle, um, which you can see at the top right corner, there's a six circles with the red um, circle on the component that we're talking about now. So this one here is our anticipatory postural adjustments. Remember that anticipatory posture adjustment is basically our body's ability to prepare us for a planned voluntary movement. So before you actually move, before you do anything, your body is doing lots of things in the background to prepare your body in order to maintain your balance when you start moving. So we already talked about the example of uh, let's say you want to step forward to grab something and you want to step forward with your right foot. Well, before you do that, your body is maybe contracting the muscles in your ankles, contracting the muscles in your um, in your trunk to keep yourself stable before you shift your weight to the left side to free up your right foot to step forward. So there's lots of things that you're doing um, to plan a voluntary movement. And this is something that's difficult for you, then perhaps some things that might be helpful would be practicing things like weight shifting. You're practicing weight shifting from leg to leg. Maybe if your feet are apart, you're practicing weight shifting sideways. Maybe one foot is forward, you're practicing weight shifting forwards and backwards. You might be doing some trunk strengthening exercise. Your trunk is nice and strong and you can um, tense your trunk before you, you voluntarily move to hold yourself in a more balanced position. Or you might be doing some limb dissociation exercises, which are mostly Pilates based, but limb dissociation exercises are things that um, uh, is basically controlling your trunk enough so that you can move your arms, legs and head in different um, directions without losing balance. 
So these are all some of the things that you might be able to do to help improve your um, anticipatory postural adjustments. And then the fourth thing on the balance list um, is our reactive postural responses. So remember, reactive postural responses um, is your body's ability to catch your balance if something unexpected were to happen as you're walking or moving. So we use the example of you're walking down the street and then all of a sudden you step in a loose pavement slab and it, it shakes and your, your foot goes under. Um, it's your body's ability to catch your balance um, and not let you fall by taking a step, basically. So essentially what you would do in rehab to help with the reactive posture responses is literally to practice stepping. So you would practice things like stepping forward, practice stepping sideways, practice stepping backwards, so multi-directional stepping and weight shifting exercises your ability to to be agile on your feet and catch your weight um, depending on what the perturbation is and then the fifth component of our balance that we talked about earlier is sensory orientation or reweighting so remember we talked about this is your body's ability to um, change emphasis on each of the three systems that we use to keep us balanced. So your vision, the fluid in your inner ears, um, the, the feeling of your feet on the terrain that you're stepping on. So your body's ability to switch focus between um, these three things, depending on the situation that you're in. So we used the example of um, if you were walking around and you're on a pretty flat ground, so you're using your vision to help you walk, but then all of a sudden the lights go out and then you're using the feeling of your feet to feel what you're stepping on um, to figure out whether there's anything you need to navigate. So that would be an example of you switching your sensory systems. And if you're someone who has issues with this and things that you might want to practice is um, strengthening each of these systems. So practicing um, balancing without your vision. So with your eyes closed, so then you can practice adjusting uh, by using the feeling in your feet or the fluid in your inner ears, or you might want to walk on on even terrain to help train some of these systems, maybe walking on inclines um, um, or if, this is still really difficult for you and this is still a main issue for, for why you're losing your balance and falling, then maybe you want to think about strategies that can help you. So moving furniture so there's not too many obstacles for you to navigate, moving throw rugs so you're not tripping on the corner of the rug, putting night lights along your bedroom walls so that if you're getting up at night to go to the bathroom and you're more a visual sensory person, you can use light as a way to um, help you navigate your surroundings. But basically, for sensory orientation reweighting, you're looking like at a, a sort of a mini obstacle course, obstacle course, if you will, where you're stepping on uneven terrain, inclined slopes, um, navigating around objects, practicing things with your eyes closed, that kind of stuff. And then the last component of balance is our dynamic gait stability, so our ability to um, um, move and walk without losing balance. So some of the things that you might be doing with your physiotherapist and rehab, if this is your issue, is you might be practicing walking at a normal speed for you and then all of a sudden changing your speed to walking really fast and then to walking really slow, as slow as you can, almost like exaggerated slow-mo walk and then back to normal walking. So being able to change your speed um, voluntarily. Uh, show signs of great control and gait uh, or walking so that might be something you're working on or you might be working on walking and then turning your head to different directions looking at different ob objects that kind of stuff so your body's ability to maintain stability even as your head is moving or you might be practicing stepping over obstacles or around obstacles um, practicing turning, uh, maybe walking in narrow spaces, or you're adding in a dual task component, which basically just means it's sort of like multitasking, where you're distracting your brain, you're trying to get your brain to divert its attention away from your mobility. So maybe you're talking while walking, you're watching a TV while you're doing something physical, um, you're listening to an audiobook as you're walking, or you're um, trying to name as many Fruits and vegetables you can think of starting from the letter A all the way to Z as you're walking. So things like that where you're diverting your attention and practicing your brain's ability to still um, keep you balanced and keep you mobile even when the attention is diverted to something else. 
Okay, I'm just gonna read some of the comments here. Um, oh, so slides, yes, the slides will be available on the website um, afterwards. So you can feel free to look at these again and the session is recorded as well. So you can, of course, look at the recording if you would like. Um, Carl says, walk the beach lots lots over and through the logs is really good yeah absolutely walking on the beach is great um especially if you're barefoot as long as you're um careful not to step on any rocks or shells because essentially the floor is moving because it's sand so you have to rely on other systems like your inner ear fluid or your vision or something like that um, to help you navigate obstacles um, Bernice says, I fall because my feet don't move going forward or sideways. Yep. So that is probably because of freezing. And for someone like you who um, has issues moving their feet and you're falling because of it, then you might want to practice things like reactive stepping. So practice things like multi-directional stepping, literally step forward with your right foot, bring it back to the middle, step sideways with your right foot, bring it back to the middle, step backwards with your right foot, bring it back to the middle, repeat on the other side. And you can make that more complicated as you go on by stepping bigger, um, reaching with your arms as you're stepping, making it quicker with your stepping, that kind of stuff. Um, Tracy says multitasking can be quite dangerous for my mom. I find I have to encourage her to be single minded when walking. Absolutely. So um, multitasking is quite dangerous for a lot of people where um, if you don't have the cognitive capacity to divert your attention to different tasks, then you might fall. So of course, I, I wouldn't encourage you to um, you know, walk on the street while talking on the phone or something like that. Definitely not. But you can practice these kind of dual tasking things in a safe environment. So maybe you're um, in your house, you're practicing, you're literally standing up and sitting down on your couch over and over again. And as you're doing the sit to stand task, you're um, having a conversation with someone or you're listening to music or watching a movie or something like that. So that it's relatively safe because you're not crossing the road. You've got something to hang on to in front of you if you lose your balance, but you're practicing doing something physical as you're diverting your attention somewhere else. So it doesn't always have to be you know, talking while you're walking, it could be anything. It could be sitting down in a chair, you're doing punches, you're doing physical task of punching as you're trying to talk to someone or concentrate on something without losing the amplitude and the effort in your physical movement. That's a really good way to rehab your dual tasking as well. Uh, Pluto says, what can I do in, uh, if my husband suddenly started, um, I think that says running, without control and stumble okay so i think what you mean here is when you um start walking and then your feet kind of festinates and then your body keeps going forward and you're and you're going out of control and your feet are lagging behind your body and you fall forward so back to that sort of freezing gait pattern so again for things like that really good ways of helping catch your balance is literally to practice stepping so multi-directional stepping using that stepping response as a way to catch yourself and catch your balance when these kind of fascination of gait happen. So stepping forward, stepping sideways, stepping backwards, literally practice stepping. So you might be someone who's walking and then you can have someone shout out to you uh, forward and then you step forward or something like that. Or then you're, and then you go back to your normal walking um, side, you step to the side and then you go back to your walking back, you step to the back and you keep walking. So that kind of reactive stepping strategy is really good to help you catch a balance because for whatever reason, you're not able to catch a balance as you're walking. So uh, because of freezing, your body is going forward, maybe because of biomechanical restraints, so one of the first things of balance that we talked about, maybe your hips are more stiff, your trunk is more stiff, so you're really rigid, you're really forward, so a lot of weight is heavy and forward, so you're falling forward. Um, it might be anticipatory posture responses where your body can prepare you for movement before you do the voluntary movement. So as soon as you start moving, you fall. Um, so all of these things are um, what we're talking about in terms of balance, all these strategies of what you can do for each of these things um, in the component of balance to help you improve each of these things so we can see here already in this slide there's six um blue circles so these are all the components that make a balance so you can see here already that balance is a very complicated um, system is not just a reflex it's not like you're practicing your reflex response but there's all these six things that contribute to balance and um and 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 it's really important for you to find out what your issue is, because just because you're someone who says you have bad balance or you have poor balance, it doesn't necessarily mean that 
all six of these things are out of whack for you. It might be a couple of these things, it might be four of these things, or it might, might be all of these things. But it's important for you to find out what component of balance is your issue and then being able to focus on that and rehab that. Because if you're trying to improve your balance and you're just practicing standing on one leg every day, that's not really going to help you with your balance. It's going to help you be better at your single leg stand, yes, but it's not going to overall have a carryover effect to your walking and your and your balance generally, um, unless you target the specific things, the specific components of balance that you're having issues with. But of course, with that said, I want to bring your attention back to the original slide that we had that, that said, why do we fall? So the one that circled is postural instability or AKA balance, which is everything that we just talked about. Remember that balance is a small component what makes you fall. Just because you fall doesn't mean you're falling because of poor balance. You might be falling because of other things on this list. So it's important for you to figure out what your actual, if you're falling, what your issue is what things on this list is your risk factor for falling? What's causing you to fall? And then finding the strategies to help you with each of these risk factors. Or if you are someone who has posture instability or balance issues, then going back to find out which part of these six components of balance is your issue. And then being able to target each of these things specifically to help you. Um, improve your balance and prevent your falls or reduce falls. Sorry, don't like to say prevent falls because you can't 100% prevent falls because remember everything on this list here um, are risk factors for why you fall. There's no way you can 100% get rid of these risk factors because you can't reverse time and decrease your disease duration. You can't change the amount of years you've had your Parkinson's. You can't change how severe your Parkinson's is. You can't really change your cognitive impairment. So you can't 100% prevent falls. Unless you can 100% get rid of everything on this list, there's no way you can 100% prevent falls, but you can reduce your falls as much as possible, reduce these risk factors as much as possible by changing these things here highlighted in red, by finding strategies or rehabbing ways to help you prevent these red things as much as possible in order to improve your balance and reduce your falls. So basically, in summary, Balance is a very complicated process, and while it's common belief that having poor balance is what makes you fall, that's not actually the reality, because there are lots of things that can make you fall. It's not just balance. Balance is just a part of what can make you fall, but there's all these other things that can contribute to your fall. So it's really important if you think falls is a real issue for you, for you to find someone who can um, who, who can assess you. So a physiotherapist with, with um, training in Parkinson's and falls would be ideal for you to find out what exactly is causing you to fall, and if it is balance, what part of balance is your issue and how do you then specifically rehab each of these things? But of course, keep in mind that there are some falls that are inevitable and that you're going to, that are going to be unpredictable, that you're just going to have. Falls is a part of everyday life. No matter how fit you are, how healthy you are, you are probably more likely, you're probably going to have a fall at some point in your life. Like if you're healthy and fit, but you're walking down the street and then you slipped on some ice, you're going to fall. So there are some falls that are unpredictable, that are inevitable, and that's fine. It's something that we have to get used to. It's life. But the idea of this, of having a falls assessment is so that you can prevent having recurrent falls caused by the same things. So if you're falling because you stepped in ice and you slip, that's a complete different issue. You can't really prevent that. You can't really predict that, you know, you're going to step on something and then the floor is going to cave in underneath you and you're going to fall. Like things like that you can't prevent. But the idea is you're trying to prevent having falls caused by the same things over and over and over again. And that's um, sort of the purpose of the talk is to give you a little bit more insight about falls and and why it's such a complicated topic. And I hope that this has been helpful and I hope that um, this is giving you some practical ideas of what you can do um, to take away to help you with these falls. Now. Here's my contact details. If you had any more specific questions and you want to know a little bit more um, or you you have something specific that you want to know about yourself in terms of your fall, you can feel free to contact me. Um, so um, I, I do work for Parkinson's Society BC as well. So you can reach me at the Parkinson's BC uh, email, which is syu at parkinson.bc.ca. Or you can reach me at my um, private clinic, which is Shelley at lifeskillstherapy.ca as well. 
So like Alana mentioned, I am a, uh, a neurophysiotherapist. Um, I'm trained in PD Warrior, Dance for PD, and APPI Pilates. Um, and I'm also the advocacy officer of the GHD. Um, so feel free to email me or contact me if you would like. And if you are someone who is very keen on research and you want to read about all this stuff and you want to know a little bit more, I've got two lovely pages of references here. Um, which I know it's probably too small for you to see right now, but if you would like these references and you want to read them, please let me know and I can send these to you and you can do a little bit of um, bedtime reading. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. I'm just going to read the comments now because I think I might have missed some questions. Um, so let me go back. So I think the last comment I read was about Tracy's comment with her mom and multitasking. So Pluto says, what can I do um, if my husband suddenly... Oh, no, sorry. We, we read that already as well. Sorry, Alana, did you want to say something? Nope. Okay. So Tracy says, for those that fall forward, my mom wears knee pads, gardening types that attach easily that has slowed her down and prevented. Yeah, sure. So having knee pads, if you're someone who falls frequently, could definitely help uh, reduce the amount of injuries you have. But make sure that um, you also find out why you're falling and then you rehab each of the components of, 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 of the falls that we talked about to really get give yourself the best chance to reduce your falls as much as possible. Um, okay, thank you guys for the comments. I'm just trying to see if there's any other question. Tracy says, does anyone have suggestions keeping reminders? I say the same thing over and over again, and there's such resistance in her remembering the cues. Yeah, so if, if um, you're falling because of a cognitive impairment or cognitive changes where you're forgetting things or you're impulsive, Things that you might be able to do um, is um, you might be able to to have strategies in place, like maybe if you're um, always sitting in a favorite armchair in front of the TV, maybe you have sticky notes that's on your table that's in front of the armchair or on the TV that says, do not get up without somebody, or you might have um, um, a checklist that's stuck on the mirror. So every day when you brush your teeth, you look at this checklist and you remember the things that you're supposed to be doing. Or um, you might have a falls alarm in place so that every time you do stand up from your chair, an alarm goes off to alert your care, care partners um, to, to just make sure they supervise you. Or if it was um, something else that you needed help with, you can also think about linking up with an occupational therapist who is trained in cognitive um, rehab. And you might be able to find strategies and other ways to help with um, some of these cognitive impairments. Um, okay, let me see if there's any other comments or questions. Um, great, okay. Walking on slippery streets in Canada. Yeah, I mean, yes, walking on uneven surfaces is definitely a great rehab tool, but definitely be careful with the ice on the road, um, on the streets. You definitely don't want to be falling on those. So keep in mind that all of the strategies and all of the examples we talked about in terms of rehab, you want to make sure you're doing these in a safe environment, right? So you're not just, oh, well, Shelly says to multitask, I'm going to walk across the street while talking on the phone. Please don't do that. Um, definitely do it in a safe environment where you know that if you were to have a bit of a wobble, you can catch yourself or somebody is there to help you. Don't do this in an environment where it's dangerous. Thank you, everybody. Um, I don't think there's any other questions I can see here. Um, so, oh, yeah, I can show the slide of my contact info here again. So feel free to reach out to me through Parkinson's BC um, and I can try to answer your questions to the best of my abilities. In the past, I've had people email me and then we've had a um, phone conversation just to help with a little bit more individualized strategies. That's fine as well. So feel free to reach out to me if you think that you have any other questions. So I know we've gone a little bit over time. I'm so sorry. This is quite a big topic to fit into one hour, but hopefully that wasn't too boring. And hopefully um, that was something that w was pretty relatable for a lot of people. Um, yeah, so thank you everybody very much for being here today.